It's expected that uh, within this conference, uh, 700 young researchers uh, will participate and uh, these researchers uh, will share their research papers and research articles uh, through the 70 uh, research panels uh, and followed by the discussions. And in parallel, uh, 16 workshops will be organized. And one of these workshops is our workshop uh, dedicated to green cities and green development prospects. Last Friday, uh, this conference was inaugurated in the city of Genja, uh, which is the second uh, biggest administrative city of Azerbaijan and uh, first, its first capital. This year in Azerbaijan, we celebrate uh, 880th anniversary of uh, great Azerbaijani poet and philosopher Nizami Genjevi. And that's why this 2021 uh, has declared in our country as a year of Nizami Genjevi. And Nizami Genjevi, uh, he promoted through his uh, poesy, through his poems, uh, universal uh, human values. Uh, he promoted uh, multiculturalism, intercultural dialogue, as well as uh, protection of environment, uh, creation of the green spaces where people live. Uh, I can state that uh, indeed, uh, Nizami Genjevi, through his poesy, uh, promoted uh, some key elements of our today's sustainable development concept. That's why University of Economics has decided uh, to organize uh, this its third postgraduate uh, conference uh, on, macroeconom on economics and management in the city of Genja uh, and under the title of Nizami Genjevi and Sustainable Development. Back in 2015, uh, Azerbaijan was awarded by the uh, South-South Award. South-South uh, Award for the improvement of the welfare of, of, the, of its population, diminishing the literacy and poverty, as well as actions taken in the successful implementation of the Millennium Development Goals during the 2000-2015. Why uh, Azerbaijan achieved, uh, it, it was one of the success stories on uh, MDGs because it, uh, Azerbaijan has invested a lot to its to development of its human capital. And uh, thanks to human capital, uh, has achieved uh, for diversification of, of its economy, uh, uh, decreasing dependence from uh, oil and gas sectors, and development of uh, non-oil uh, sector. And just recently, uh, our government has adopted uh, national priorities 2030 for uh, next uh, 10 years. And within these uh, national priorities, uh, one of the uh, top priority, priority num number five, is uh, promotion of green economy and green growth uh, in, in Azerbaijan. And this Priority perfectly fits with our national development agenda, as well as with key items of the global development agenda, I mean, UN SDGs and global efforts on climate change. I would like to introduce uh, our speakers, uh, speakers of today's session, our panel guests. Uh, first of all, we'll start uh, within our uh, session uh, with a presentation of uh, Mr. Asad Magui who is the head of the Secretariat of the Partnership for Action on Green Economy, United Nations Environmental Program. Uh, Mr. Asad Nagui uh, will cover mostly uh, academic issues and uh, mostly will start from theoretical discussions, uh, linkage between, uh, between job creation and development of green economy. Uh, then we'll uh, switch uh, to uh, EBRD presentation on policy oriented uh, presentations on tools uh, which EBRD offer uh, to its member countries. And Mrs. Thea Milikadze, uh, Associate Director Infrastructure, Eurasia Sustainable Infrastructure Group, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, she will also present about uh, instruments and tools uh, available uh, within the EBRD for uh, these countries and particularly uh, on its Green Cities uh, project. And also I would like to uh, inform uh, the audience that the city of Genja is part of this uh, project, uh, recently joined, and is looking for, impl for successful implementation of this project in the city of Genja. Our third speaker, uh, Ms. Pilnara Roll, from United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Secretary to the Committee of Urban Development, Housing and Land Management, uh, Forest, Land and Housing Division, 
to the UNEC. Uh, we'll uh, also uh, speak on behalf of, OEC, of UNEC and uh, will inform us about tools available within the UNEC. Uh, UNEC also uh, has a pro very important project on uh, smart and sustainable cities. Uh, regularly organized uh, forum of mayors and our last but not least uh, speaker, uh, fourth speaker, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kinitaka Sakamoto, general manager of Tepsco company uh, from Japan, will inform us about uh, about its experience. It will be uh, will. Kawa will start from academic theoretical discussions uh, and then we'll switch to uh, policy-oriented issues uh, offered by international organizations. And then a uh, last speaker will inform on practical issues, how practical companies uh, implement uh, such projects. Because this company, TEPSCO company, has uh, experience on implementation of uh, smart cities in Japan and in other countries. And also, uh, this company recently was chosen by the government of Azerbaijan for uh, elaboration of master plan uh, on creation of green energy zone in the Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. I would like to uh, to uh, ask uh, Mr. Asad Nagvi uh, to take floor and to present uh, his views uh, on these uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning, um, colleagues. And Admirals, thank you so much for the invitation to, to join um, this panel. So I have, I, I started, <laughs> you didn't mention, but it's it felt that I was actually spending the uh, weekend in Azerbaijan because I was watching the Grand Prix with my son. And there are a few messages that are coming out very clearly from that one, which was that, okay, don't focus only on fixing the engines, but keep keep uh, take good care of your tires as well so the soft side is equally important so with that one i just wanted to number one say that thank you so much for joining us congratulations to um this organizing team for pulling this panel together and i have only a few messages that i would like to deliver so basically, I wanted to communicate three messages in this morning's presentation. And the first one comes from that there are few mega trends that we are seeing around the world. And, and they happen at global level, and they also happen at the national level. And, and if you look at them, it's very clear that we have increasing inequality around the world, which is happening now. The rich and poor gap is increasing. and now, not only increasing, but it is getting to a level where like 10 people in the world own more wealth than 3.5 billion people combined together. We are seeing that the biodiversity is losing, which is the ecological foundation of our economy, and we see a sizzling planet. But if you look at you know, the background and the root causes of this, it, it, it indicates to the same, same problems. And the problem basically comes from an economic planning system, which is made to generate growth at the cost of social inequalities and environmental degradation. And in the green economy, that was the primary agenda that we were trying to basically address. On top of it now, we have COVID. So because of COVID, the things have gotten even worse, but there is nothing new that COVID has brought except for the health problems. The, 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 the challenges that we are facing now of increasing poverty and inequality, the increasing pressure on natural resources, increasing unemployment and especially youth unemployment, the problems that countries face in serving their debts and are defaulting and exclusive attention to regaining growth, that was already there. It's just that COVID has put a magnifying glass on it and it has made it more, more visible. And the message that is coming out when we look at the global data sets, it's very clear that the way we restart and stimulate our economies will actually decide if future risks or threats to prosperity are amplified or mitigated. And that's where I think the discussion around green economy, green recovery and green cities comes very relevant. So I will define probably in two slides, what do we mean by green economy and why it's different from a normal economy? 
So in normal economy, the job of growth and income is, is driven by anything as long as it produces growth. Green economy was an effort to repurpose it and basically say that an economy in which growth of jobs and income is driven by policies and investments that, that address global sustainability challenges and social inequality. That is what green economy is. So basically that you know, what we have been hearing in the past, that growth without a purpose is an unnecessary evil. And green economy was an effort that we need to have a purpose. And the purpose is that we create social equalities, we create employment, and we create environmental sustainability. So the green economy was not an exclusively an environmental project. And that's important because many of, many, that's a general perception. The green economy was a project which probably this slides present best in my view in terms of indicators of how you measure your progress on the green economy, that we need to increase the human development index while reducing the human ecological footprint. So that we start living in the biocapacity of the earth and we have the maximum prosperity. And that's why there is a difference between how green economy happens in different countries and how greening of economy will happen in developing countries and in developed countries. In developing countries, we need to focus on improving the human development index while staying low carbon and low ecological footprint. In developed countries, there is a major challenge in reducing the ecological footprint, but both can generate jobs and employment. So moving away from high consumption to low consumption can create new type of jobs and new type of employment opportunities as much as you know, focusing on improving human development index while keeping your ecological footprints can do in developing countries. And I will come with a few examples. What are the most common type of initiatives that are probably relevant, number one, at global level, but probably also for Azerbaijan? So where I am getting this data is that we are now tracking global green recovery expenditures around the world. And till the end of February, early March, before the US injected another two trillion into the global, in, into its economy, we, we tracked $14.6 trillion that have been spent so far on recovery efforts. Most of it is basically a rescue planning so far. So there is a long way to go on recovery. But if you look at the recovery about out of 2 trillion, there is only 341 billion, which looks like environmentally friendly expenditures. But that's where I think the focus has to be in the future, that how do we merge rescue, recovery, and stimulation together? And that's where my feeling is that cities become the epicenter of this economic growth model in which the social, environmental, and economic development can come together. The first area that is coming out very clearly is building circularity into the economies. And I was looking at few indicators for Azerbaijan. And if I look at the major economic competitiveness challenges that Azerbaijan is facing, it is the cost of material in the per unit of GDP that is produced. And the second one is the cost of energy per unit of GDP, which is produced, are fairly high. And that probably makes the, the Azerbaijanese products less competitive in the global market because there is more material use and there is more energy put into it. So sort of like building circularity in the green economy or in the economy will help it. And there are a few things that, few ideas which are here on this slides, and these slides will be shared with you. So I'll not go into detail. Mobility is another area where number one, the investments are possible. Number two, there are huge gains. And number three, there are connections to the economy and the markets. And mobility is not only for individuals. The mobility includes connecting the markets, the local markets with each other, and then markets connected in the region. Energy transition, probably other colleagues will talk about it far better than I can, but it's a very clear message that yes, we need an energy transition and energy transition has become far more affordable and cheaper and profitable in, in many of the countries in the region. I think financing gap 
is an important area and it's i'm happy to see colleagues who who basically come from finance and especially from private sector and ebrd that that's an area where now we feel that number one the demand is high number two the need is high and number three the economic and financial returns on those investments which are uh, put into green economy transition are much better number four there is a branding issue there is an image issue and number five there is a huge consumer demand for this my last point on this one is especially for the youth and youth employment issues that yes it is the financing of the green economy transition which will create new jobs and jobs for the youth i'm looking at data from ilo which has recently come out which says that yes it is the it is the green and digital economy which has the highest potential to create jobs in the future if you look at the undp's report on sdg push it also talks about green economy being the job multiplier of the future but of course what they say is that financing is the connecting link between the two sides restoration of ecosystems i think that's where i think the poverty and inequality in rural areas can be connected with economic growth at the national level and there are examples we had done an initial scoping study and i was talking with elmer on friday about this which basically identifies a few priority areas which are probably low hanging fruits for transition of economy this study was conducted in 2013 i believe 2013 2014 so it's worth a revisit and i'm very happy to see that we are speaking here with the university which has probably one of the best expertise on macroeconomics they might like to look and revisit these findings and probably update them so three areas energy production agriculture and transport with the enabling conditions of regulations and standard fiscal policy instruments institutional policy and processes and financing the transition we are now supporting two major projects so one was on green economy the other one which elmer was talking about is environment for europe where we are working together with oecd the economic commission for europe unido and the world bank and we are supporting six countries in the region basically to support that their natural capital is increasing while people's well-being is also increasing so again bringing the human development index at the interface of lower ecological footprint and we are grateful to our funding partners like european union for supporting this effort it has five components and you will see them when i share my slides but it's basically on decision making circular economy monitoring progress environmental level environmental level playing fields and ecosystem services the other project that i basically had is is page and that's where i will probably end my presentation and and leave the time for others to come in in page we are looking at really at the macroeconomics we believe that the root causes of unsustainable development are in the economic planning system which then influences all the sectoral and thematic thematic policies as they are implemented so we try to focus on the major drivers of economic change in a country and try to make them more sustainable and socially inclusive so we provide support on policy analysis on national development planning on catalyzing finance and we build capacity and forge partnerships between different sectors so we have five un agencies which provide specialized expertise on development environment economic growth employment and industry and competitiveness and you will find more of these uh, in my on on these links that, that i will share with you i have just three concluding points to make number 1 with projects we can go uh, really far and that is very helpful but the projects are good to create models the transformational shift that is needed to achieve the sustainable development goals will come with policy reforms number 2 poverty inequality and environmental degradation are two sides of the same coin and result of the same system which is producing which has failed to produce a development which leaves no one behind we need to change that and to change that i will just give you a metaphor which comes from i come from pakistan and that metaphor comes from pakistan there was a village next to a river 
and one day i have only 2 minutes left one day the villagers saw a few dead bodies in the village so they decided to give it a very respectful funeral the following day they saw more bodies and they kept increasing every day so the whole village got into giving funerals to the bodies till the day that a few of them decided that they will not do it anymore and they started walking upstream and they said we want to stop those who are killing these people i think we have to move upstream in economics to make sure that the system which is creating inequality and environmental degradation is stopped i'll stop here thank you so much for your time and i'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have thank you challenges for for development of green economy in developed countries and in developing countries are different and we learned it from your uh, presentation once again and also we uh, learned uh, from your presentation that for development of green economy uh, indeed uh, there are a limited choice for development uh, of uh, economy but uh, for short term it could have uh, more challenges for developing countries but for long term probably it will have Uh, it will be more useful for these countries it is very important uh, for uh, for developing countries and for developed countries uh, to develop also uh, research research on this issue because research based policies uh, it is indeed uh, at the end of the day uh, it will uh, work more efficiently in the case of azerbaijan uh, thank you very much you mentioned uh, several uh, fields uh, like energy production agriculture and transport transport sectors for greening uh, of uh, economy i would like just to inform you that uh, we have several uh, projects uh, implemented in different parts of azerbaijan and particularly in the city of baku uh, we have uh, we have project on clean city project of the ministry of economy which is a circular economy project uh, and it was uh, presented uh, at the exhibition uh, during the first mayors forum in 2019 in UNEC the second biggest project also a white city project and it is actually it is green city project it is also one of the success stories and one of the biggest challenge also for development of green economy in, in the case of azerbaijan it was uh, it was occupation of its territory uh, one fifth of its territory 20% of its territory was occupied during almost 30 years illegally by neighboring armenia and uh, it it has also very considerable negative impact uh, for development of green economy and also for our efforts on climate change because one example because on the one side we uh, we started to realize efficient reforestation policy in azerbaijan creation development of forest but on the other side uh, in our in, in our occupied territories it was implemented urbacid ecocide uh, and uh, distortion of forests and other green areas in the occupied territories that's why uh, now uh, president of azerbaijan has announced that uh, this uh, territory which was before occupied and 20% of the territory of azerbaijan it's karabakh region now it will be green energy zone and it will be Uh, one of the example for development of green economy and also uh, smart cities and green cities it's also it was challenge for us but now uh, it is still uh, liberated and now uh, tepsco also will elaborate a master plan for uh, development of green energy so on the agriculture also for example in that region just recently we uh, started implementation of the project on development of smart village Uh, smart cities and smart village and uh, smart village i mean using uh, information technologies to increase efficiency and to, to increase productivity uh, and at the end of the day as you mentioned it will uh, it will uh, make azerbaijani products uh, when it is they will be export more competitive because uh, at the end of the day for us uh, smart city smart uh, village all this concept it is tool it is is not the uh, final uh, purpose just to create this but it is purpose to achieve uh, more efficiency more productivity in the case of transport it is also the same issue we are now uh, on the way uh, to uh, to uh, to implement a green 
transport projects uh, in Azerbaijan and in different parts of Azerbaijan. Uh, I would like once again to thank you for a very interesting presentation. And uh, I think that uh, more important now it is follow up to ensure follow up because our purpose uh, with uh, this university uh, to ensure follow up of these discussions jointly to organize uh, next uh, conferences. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would like now to invite our uh, second speaker, uh, representative of uh, EPRD, uh, to uh, present uh, EPRD's view uh, on uh, green cities. Uh, as I mentioned already, our second city, city of Genja, just recently uh, joined to the Green Cities project uh, of EPRD. Uh, thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, let me start with with a very brief introduction of myself. So, as a senior banker, I'm working on development and implementation of infrastructure projects in the Caucasus. But in parallel, I am co-leading EBRD Green Cities, the program that which is operational in uh, all banks' countries of operation. So today, I'm pleased to present Green Cities and its application to cities and projects. Um, so. As we all know, cities are dynamic and vital parts of society and are the main engines of social, economic, technological development. Cities are also a major driver of environmental impact. So IBRD has launched its Green Cities program, which draws on best practice approaches linking strategic planning to investments. So its main components are delivery of strategy and policy support achieved through Green City Action Plans, which we call GCAPs, facilitating green city infrastructure investments, capacity building, and technical assistance. And the program is also providing access to green finance to interested cities. This is a wide, rapidly expanding network, which now stands at 47 cities. They are at different stages of GCAP preparation. The green cities unites both large cities like Cairo, Alexandria, Amman, Izmir, as well as medium-sized and smaller cities. So this gives opportunities of networking and information exchanges between them. In five years since its launch, achievements have been significant. The program already mobilized 1.5 billion of EBRD and donor finance for green sustainable infrastructure. More than 800 million has been already invested. And to better illustrate the magnitude of CO2 savings achieved from these projects, this is equivalent to permanently taking 166,000 cars off the road. Green City is open to all cities in the BRD region that meet the following eligibility criteria. The city must be located in the BRD's country of operation. It should have a population of around at least 100,000, but in some cases we can consider smaller cities. The city should be committed and interested to conduct a GCAP, which is a comprehensive exercise. A trigger project should be initiated in one of the infrastructure sectors like water, solid waste, energy efficiency, renewable energy, etc. And the project must target reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, energy or resource consumption or pollution, or they should have significant climate resilience benefits. So to explain how the program works, to initiate their participation in the program, cities must launch a so-called trigger project in one of the program's investment sectors. These trigger projects then covenant the development of a green city action plan. During the GCAP development, cities' environmental performance and current challenges are mapped based on international benchmarks, and then the priorities are agreed, developed, and the city establishes long-term vision, medium-term targets, and the short-term actions. Uh, possibly I could bring example from my hometown, Tbilisi, where we started the program with the bus project, then the Green City Action Plan was developed, and since then the priority areas have been defined for the city, which the city will be working on in the coming years. Uh, very important strength of the program is linked to the stakeholder engagement, which is ensured through the GCAP development process. At least three such workshops are organized during the process, and these events are publicized on Iberde Green City West, uh, City's website. Uh, and the events are attended by a wide range of stakeholders, including universities, CSOs, community groups, so on. Uh, 
Uh, to date, approximately, I think, 4,000 people have provided inputs to different GCAPs. Um, in addition to network expansion, we're trying to go deeper, uh, which means that we want to finance as much as uh, the, invest in the follow-up uh, investments, which were identified as part of the GCAPs. Uh, so far, we managed to maintain a relatively even balance. You see that 20 follow-up uh, projects have been invested in out of the uh, signed 43. And the sector-wise, we also have a diverse portfolio, and we plan to expand it further with new products, which I will quickly cover shortly. This is just one of the many examples of the Green City project. Uh, in Chisinau, Moldova, IBRD is supporting renovation and retrofit of 120 public buildings by implementing energy and resource efficiency measures. Uh, the project uh, culminated the development of a Green City Action Plan. And uh, actually, I must say that uh, we're thankful to our donors for co-financing the project. And in this case, it has been E5P and the EIB is also co-financing the project. Uh, very briefly about the lessons learned. After nearly five years of operation, obviously, there are quite a few lessons learned. Uh, first of all, is that uh, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, so we are applying flexibility in structuring the green city engagement, uh, given the varied capacities of cities and specific needs of each client. Uh, IBRD stands by uh, each city and supports them during implementation of projects and GCAPs. Uh, we believe that another key aspect has been the holistic approach that the green cities has linked investments through a strategic vision through GCAPs. Uh, one uh, very important aspect which I've mentioned uh, is stakeholder engagement, which is an integral part. And we haven't stopped during COVID times as well. We have moved to the online platforms. Uh, one aspect which I could also mention is a network of up to five cities, which provides the ideal forum for knowledge sharing and outreach. We are organizing events like uh, gatherings. And for instance, this week, uh, EBRD hosts the Green Cities Annual Conference. Uh, discussions will cover how cities can deliver climate action. Um, as program involved, uh, we started to further develop the process. And now GCAP is taking even more holistic approach. While initially green cities only looked into traditional infrastructure subprojects, the sectoral coverage is now expanded into new products such as smart technologies, resilience, integration of renewables into the program nature-based solutions, and so on. Uh, as Mr. Elmar mentioned, we are pleased to see Ganja joining Green Cities. Uh, we are working closely with authorities to prepare trigger investment, which in this case will be solid waste management improvements. Uh, the project will finance waste collection, equipment and vehicles, smart infrastructure, improvements in maintenance, and equipment for improvement of operations of the dump site. Uh, the project will be accompanied with significant technical assistance to help the city in GCAP development in project implementation and so on. Uh, this is our website, dbrdgreencities.com, where we are updating information on all the cities, uh, on the GCAPs and related projects. So here's my contacts and I'll be happy to answer questions which you have. Thank you for the attention. Uh, thank you very much, Thea, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Indeed, it is very useful uh, to uh, review different tools of different international organizations in this session. And I would like to request the audience, uh, our researchers, our, our uh, students and the audience, uh, to address uh, questions in the chat and uh, university representative will, uh, will direct to me these questions and I will address to our panelists. And uh, we look forward to elaboration of Green City Action Plan for the city of uh, Genja. And also, uh, we look forward uh, to uh, to see uh, someday smart trams uh, in the city of Genja. Actually, there are global trends for smart trams, which are actually electric buses, which are green transport uh, element. And that's why we look forward to this, one, uh, this uh, project also. As I know, for trigger project, there are three sectors uh, were defined for the city of Genja, which is, you mentioned, waste management, city lighting also, and also uh, public transport issue. Uh, I will uh, now uh, request uh, our uh, 
colleague from uh, UNEC, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, Ms. Gulnara uh, Roll, and to uh, also to present uh, views of United Nations Economic Commission of Europe on uh, smart sustainable cities, because it could be also very useful to review uh, UNEC vision on this issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, dear colleagues. Thank you so much for the invitation for this workshop. I think this UNEC presentation here after the presentation of UNEP and EBRD is uh, it's a it's a very good complementary presentation because it's it's more be more practical and in a way of course it's supporting very much the ideas of the green economy which were presented uh, by uh, both uh, uh, Assad and also Tia uh, before. Um, so uh, uh, UNEC is a regional commission uh, which is an uh, inter intergovernmental organization bringing together 56 member states uh, of UNEC region, uh, including Azerbaijan, which is a very important and active uh, participant of the UNEC. At the UNEC, we're working very actively on the approach of the smart sustainable cities. And I would like to, uh, right away to say that it's very much connecting to the topics of uh, uh, addressing the climate change consequences, addressing the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemics, uh, making sure that the transport systems, the construction system uh, are becoming uh, more climate neutral, more green. So this is a very important topic that we're working on. So in my presentation, I would like to present a few projects that we're working on in the UNEC region. We don't have projects at the, at the at, uh, at the moment in Azerbaijan, but I hope that this would be any good information for the further engagement. And also, uh, as we actually discussed uh, uh, before with Elmar, that uh, indeed uh, UNEC has its own secretariat in Geneva, and it also has eight centers of excellence in different countries, which are working uh, on ground in order to implement uh, different international commitments on ground. So uh, probably the closest, closest geographically uh, to Azerbaijan would be probably the center uh, in Estonia, which is looking into energy efficiency, or otherwise on the smart sustainable cities, uh, we have uh, centers of excellence working uh, in uh, Glasgow, UK, uh, in Trondheim, Norway, uh, in Italy, Spain, so in quite in, in Albania, in Tehran, Albania. So really, we are trying to work to ensure that uh, all these principles, very very important principles, are implemented locally. And the centers also are organized in cooperations, usually with the municipalities, but also with the universities. So that as also it's a good example of uh, where we're also engaging very closely universities. And I also would like to mention that, of course, uh, in our work, we are very closely working also with other agencies, including, for instance, UNEP, because UNEP, of course, also here in Geneva, the colleagues working on cities and housing. So uh, among the very concrete projects that we're working on uh, is uh, improve sustainable urban development in the region cities, where, of course, the region cities are very well developed. Uh, so we're working on developing smart, sustainable city profiles. But really, with Norway, we're working uh, more on developing, in a way, very innovative approaches. For instance, how we connect the smart, sustainable city concept to the volunteer local reviews, because we know that uh, we're all working towards achieving the uh, 2030 agenda, achieving the SDGs, uh, and volunteer national review at national level and volunteer local reviews at the local level are very important political documents. Uh, sometimes they don't have enough content. So how we connect our uh, very active technical cooperation work uh, on the smart sustainable cities with a political commitment of cities to achieve SDGs to the preparation of volunteer and local reviews. So this is one of the directions that we're working with our colleagues in Norway. And of course, uh, this presentation doesn't really allow to provide more details, but we'll be very happy to explain more uh, next time. 
Another very important methodological project, and I will explain a bit about its approach, uh, it is Smart Sustainable Cities or 2030 Agenda as a new urban agenda where we have pilot projects uh, in the cities of Almaty, Kazakhstan, Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, Belize, Georgia, and Podgorica, uh, Montenegro. So this uh, project is uh, bringing together the approaches of evidence-based, and here you see uh, the set of indicators that were using. It's a key performance indicators for smart sustainable cities. These indicators we developed together with uh, International Telecommunication Union, and also it is implemented in cooperation with other 14 UN agencies and programs uh, who are working to, um, in a way, mark, uh, review the performance, apply this evidence-based approach to uh, measuring performance of cities uh, and to understand what are the priority actions the city would need to uh, take, uh, what are the priority actions uh, need to take in order to make cities sustainable and smart. Uh, of course, this is not uh, a complete set of indicators, uh, so this is why we're using, in a way, uh, by plug-and-play approach, uh, also additional indicators. For instance, of course, now uh, overcoming the COVID-19 pandemic is very important, so for instance, we are using uh, additional set of indicators uh, on the economics of, uh, um, uh, you know, how to, to, to help the cities to overcome the pandemic consequences. And from this point of view, I think UNEP approach looking in more into the macroeconomics of it is very close to our hearts. So I think this is really a very important approach. And this is, you see on the screen, two projects that we're working on, uh, again, in the cities in Albania, Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine, uh, in Montenegro, to address uh, economic consequences of pandemic and looking really more into this kind of macroeconomic approach and also looking into the innovative financing approaches. Uh, and of course, this information can be uh, looked later on at our website. So again, just to say that innovative financing is very, very important because it's, of course, it's very important to look into the municipal budget itself and look in a more very comprehensive way. and. In addition to that, also to look into specific projects uh, for possible investments. So we're also working with different uh, uh, international financial institutions, for instance, in the project on the economic recovery from COVID-19. We're working with UN Capital Development Fund, who, which has its own methodology. So we're trying to also to implement the approaches developing, developed by the UN uh, capital Development Fund on the innovative financing, because this is definitely a very important approach. So I mentioned we're trying to connect really this evidence-based approach that we developed through the Smart Sustainable Cities within the United for Smart Sustainable Cities initiative to the volunteer local review. And this is kind of a scheme which shows uh, how we're trying to connect a very uh, detailed technical work on collection data, analysis of the data, to the assessment of achieving the SDGs at the local level. We also have developed a series of other tools, for instance, a guide on smart sustainable uh, to circular cities. It actually was led by the city of Dubai, uh, but also in cooperation with ITU and other uh, colleagues uh, in the UN agencies and the United for Smart Sustainable Cities. Uh, we are working a lot on the housing 2030. We are also looking into the topics of uh, affordable housing from the point of view of governance, uh, policies, finance, uh, climate change. Uh, another initiative that we're working is a three in cities challenge, and this is where we'll be very happy to have more cities from Azerbaijan joining uh, joining this uh, initiative. Uh, so this is a web page. Uh, so you can join actually through the web page, which also has instructions how to do that, to promote the nature-based solutions uh, at the city level. Finally, I would like to invite you to the next forum of mayors, uh, because of course uh, we are working on different technical cooperation projects in many different cities and countries, and we organize the first forum of mayors on 6 October 2020. So the second forum of mayors will be taking place on the 4th and 5th of April 2022. It will be organized uh, back to back uh, uh, with uh, uh, regional 
uh, regional forum for sustainable development. So it will be feeding into the work of both intergovernmental committee on urban development of the UNEC as well as into the work of the regional forum. So the voice of the cities will be also heard at the regional forum, which is a forum obviously for mostly national uh, governments. So. Uh, we will discuss how cities are aligning with the Geneva Declaration of Mayors, which was adopted uh, at the first forum. And you see here is the major directions. You see that many of the topics that were presented at the presentation of uh, both UNEP and BRD also here. So, I mean, again, it shows that all the international organizations are really working, uh, kind of speaking in one voice. Uh, so, uh, on 4th and 5th uh, April 2022, we'll be looking into the topics of uh, sustainable buildings, sustainable transport, um, into use of land uh, for housing, urban infrastructure. So we'll be very happy uh, to have that forum also to discuss uh, further programs uh, of making cities more smart and sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, indeed for this uh, very useful and very interesting presentation, uh, vision of UNEC. Indeed, uh, key performance indicators for smart, sustainable cities, uh, it's very useful. Uh, I know that it was translated into several languages of the United Nations and uh, were used also by uh, our colleagues. Uh, also, uh, during the post-COVID-19 uh, period, it will be very fruit. It will be very fruitful also uh, discussions and cooperation. Uh, how can how uh, the cities uh, can uh, address uh, challenges? Uh, on the one side, uh, COVID nineteen uh, pandemic uh, created a lot of problems, uh, a lot of challenges for cities. Uh, but on the other side, also to some extent, accelerated digitalization and even our forum today, with great pleasure, uh, will participate uh, and will encourage our cities uh, to participate in uh, Trees in Cities initiative. Uh, because uh, each year, we uh, each year, each month, uh, each week uh, in Azerbaijan, in different parts of Azerbaijan, uh, we have different initiatives. We have also active NGOs in this field. Uh, we have uh, NGO, for example, IDEA, uh, which is a uh, promoter of uh, environment. Uh, and uh, by the support of uh, Minister of Environment and also this NGO IDEA uh, in Azerbaijan, in different parts of Azerbaijan, cities also actively participate for development and creation of uh, green spaces in cities. Uh, for, thank you very much for the invitation for the uh, second uh, forum of players. Uh, we'll definitely participate. And also, I would like to inform you that uh, we are actively uh, using uh, different recommendations, different tools of UNEC on smart, sustainable cities now for elaboration of master plans for our cities, uh, uh, our cities which were uh, liberated from occupation recently. Uh, we are using uh, all this recommendation. It's indeed uh, very useful. Uh, now I would like to uh, to switch to our uh, fourth, uh, last uh, but not least, uh, speaker uh, presentation. Before uh, this presentation, I would like to inform the audience and so our panelists. So probably now, uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, liberated its occupied territories and uh, now uh, we have different challenges if uh, during the millennium development goals we had challenges that 20 percent of uh, our territory were occupied and uh, environment in this uh, region also were degraded and uh, destroyed but now uh, we have uh, implemented uh, four resolutions of united security council and liberated these territories but at the same time we have now different uh, challenges, challenges that we have discovered that urbacid, ecocid were uh, implemented in this uh, region and our cities and villages intentionally destroyed, fully destroyed. For example, the city of Agdam, which was one of the biggest city of Azerbaijan, uh, several foreign journalists where I came to this uh, city, they called uh, the city as a uh, Hiroshima of the 21st century or Hiroshima of the Caucasus. Uh, unfortunately, this is a uh, realities that we face, uh, but despite of uh, all these challenges, uh, on uh, 10 November 
President of Azerbaijan, uh, President of Russia, and Prime Minister of Armenia signed a peace declaration, which ended the uh, war uh, between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And now we hope finally we'll switch to the regional cooperation between uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, a trilateral uh, cooperation, and also more uh, broadly regional cooperation. Uh, and for example, in this peace declaration, one of the elements also uh, the development of uh, restoration of communication, all communication in the region within the EU, uh, this year, 2021, the year of the uh, development of railways. Uh, taking into account that railways also uh, one of the public transport, which has a minimum, uh, minimum negative impact to environment. Uh, it is uh, important development of railways and one of the elements of this peace declaration signed on 10 November, it is development of communication. And, uh, and now uh, I would like uh, to ask our uh, fourth uh, speaker, uh, which is responsible at uh, this company, also development of the uh, green energy zone in, this, in, in the Karabakh region of Azerbaijan, to inform uh, the audience about the experience of this company uh, for development of smart uh, cities in Japan and in other countries, and at the same time inform uh, the audience about the plans for development of uh, green energy zone and uh, elaboration of master plan in the Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sakamoto, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my material? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, this is Kunitaka Sakamoto from Tepsco. Tokyo Electric Power Service Company. I would like to express my sincere gratitude, Mr. Mamadov, for giving me the opportunity to present our work. I will give a presentation on the establishment of the green energy zone in the Karaf region of Azerbaijan. Establishment of the green energy zone and elaboration of the master plan. I will focus on an example of a, a smart city in Japan that we are investigating in green energy zone project. Finally, I will give you a brief overview of the green energy zone master plan for Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. First, let me give a brief TEPSCO at a glance. TEPSCO is 100% subsidiary company of TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, and provides engineering services on energy worldwide. It has implemented 865 projects, including an energy sector uh, study and engineering services on small thermal power plant construction in Azerbaijan. And this and this May, we started study on the GZ master plan for the uh, Karaf region. I'm the project, project manager for this project. We are currently researching the overview of smart cities in Japan and overseas in order to obtain basic data for the development of a master plan for the Karaf region. In our research, we found various types of smart cities. A residential type smart city consists of residence and facilities that support the lives of residents, such as community center. A building type smart city integrates university, commercial facilities, and residence. An uh, industrial type smart city gathers factories and power supply facility to form an industrial park. In this presentation, I will give an overview of the Fujisawa SST, which is assumed to have a high affinity with the Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. Fujisawa SST Sustainable Smart Town is located in Huisawa City. Huisawa City is a residential area located about 50 meters from Tokyo. 
Vista of SST was built in 2014 on the site of former Panasonic factory in Fisawa City. It covers an area 90 hectares. And it includes uh, 1,000 housing units, commercial facilities, welfare facilities, various clinics, and daycare centers, ETC. This area is residential area. You may feel that it is dense and narrow. Japan has a high population density, and this is common status in urban areas. A standard smart house, house in Fisawa SST has a rooftop solar uh, with battery and HEMS, Home Electric Energy Management System. Customer choose between all electric house and fuel cell type house according to their energy needs. HEMS allows residents to see how much electricity their household is using. A service that provides energy related advice is also available. For electric vehicles, a battery station is installed in the town. And a sharing service is provided. The FISA SST in, is unique in its planning process. The first step is, was to define the lifestyle of the people living in the town. Then to design the spaces. And finally, to design the infrastructure. In Japan, infrastructure design is often the starting point. But this project is unique in that it started with lifestyle. The concept of lifestyle is community, mobility, energy, security, and wellness. After lifestyle, lifestyle, a target figures were set. Environmental target are uh, CO2 70% reduction, water consumption 30% reduction. Energy target is renewable energy usage over 30%. Safety and security target is lifeline maintenance three days. The current target achievement status are CO2 mostly achieved, water consumption mostly achieved, and renewable energy usage 70% or more. The results are good. Developing a smart city requires the cooperation of many companies, including those involved in planning, construction, and operation. Companies from various inter industries representing Japan have been cooperating with the Fisawa SST project from the initial planning stage. Starting with Panasonic, a manufacturer of electric products, a wide range industry are participating in the project, project including medical, welfare, energy, telecommunications, banking, trading, transportation, and security. For example, TEPCO and Tokyo Gas are participate, participate, participating for energy. And also, it's a security company is participating for security. TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, as mentioned earlier, is the parent company of TEPSCO. These company make up the Fisawa SST Council. Fisawa man SST Management Company operates uh, operate uh, FISAWA SST. And FISAWA SST committee is self governance organization of the town. These organizations were also established. Today, the FISAWA SST committee, the FISAWA SST management company, FISAWA SST council, 
and Fisawa City ETC continue to communicate and work closely together to operate Fisawa SST. They, they are able to continuously improve the town in accordance with the changes in society. Let me summarize my thoughts on Fisawa SST. Number one, I think it is important to start with concept rather than starting with hardware. For Fisawa SST, they started with the lifestyle of people living in a small city, smart city. Number two, setting target is very important. Number three, it is also important for related companies to get together and promote the study from various pers pers perspectives. If residents, operation company, related company, local government, ETC, make close collaboration and communication to manage the town, it will be possible to respond to social changes and technical innovations. Number four, building a town is not the end of the story. Continuous action over a long period is important, I think. Finally, I would like to give you a brief overview of the Green Energy Zone Master Plan for Karabakh region. First of all, we, we are considered to use renewable energy sources for energy supply in the region. We will create a developing plan for hydropower, solar power, wind power, and power grid system. We are assuming a lot of potential for renewable uh, energy in Karabakh region. While renewable energy reduces the environment impact, it, can, it may have a, a negative impact on the power grid system. So I think it is important to take appropriate countermeasures to avoid a negative impact, impact on power grid system. Next, we will consider smart city proposal that are consistent with the station in the Karabakh region. We will make proposal from the, from the perspective on energy efficiency, transportation, uh, such as EV, construction city, construction city building, and technology. Referring to the case of Fisawa SST as explained earlier and other examples of the Karabakh region and Azerbaijan. That is all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask. During the question and answer session, Ms. Surya will assist me as an interpreter. Thank you very much. Mr. Sakamoto, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, first of all, indeed, it is very uh, useful to learn uh, experience, your experience on uh, development of a smart city in the uh, site of the Panasonic company. It was indeed very useful uh, for us uh, to uh, learn this experience. As we all know, uh, one of the main pillar of the green economy it is the green energy. That's why uh, this green energy uh, zone, creation of the green energy zone in Azerbaijan, in uh, one of our uh, uh, main regions, uh, Karabakh region of Azerbaijan, it is indeed a very important project. And uh, we look forward uh, for successful implementation of uh, this project and we wish you uh, all the best. Now I would like, I received uh, several uh, questions uh, to our panelists. All the audience thank uh, for all panelists for a very interesting presentations and uh, first questions uh, addressed to uh, Mr. Asad Nagui uh, to for to first question uh, for first uh, presentation. Uh, be, there is such a question that uh, you mentioned that in developed countries and in developing countries uh, targets are also to some extent different. If in developed countries target is more ecological targets in developing countries more economical targets, uh, job creation, GDP growth, uh, all uh, this issue. Uh, how, uh, what do you think? How uh, efficiently could be balanced these two, uh, two, uh, two targets? On the one side, 
uh, for particularly for uh, developing countries, dynamically developing countries like uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, on the one side, uh, to create jobs, uh, to develop, uh, to uh, ensure efficient growth of the GDP. On the other side, also uh, dynamically develop green economy in Azerbaijan. How efficiently we can uh, balance between environmental and economical uh, targets. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I answer the question, I, I would really like to appreciate the presentations from my fellow panelists. And I wanted to really request that if you can share the email addresses between us so that we can follow up on each other's because we are doing so much complimentary work. And I think it will be also beneficial for Azerbaijan. So that's one thing. So congratulations on such a great panel. Uh, number two on your questions that how we can balance the the different objectives. My feeling is that the targets and indicators are different, but objective is the same. I think we all want to get to a planet where no one is left behind and which is good for our living and, and living our future generations. So that is one thing. Number two, yes, on employment and other things, there are different targets. Like in developing countries, we need more jobs and more employment, whereas in developed countries, we have shortage of labor. So we are going more into the mechanization. And that's where I think the difference will come in that what type of interventions, different type of economies in the world will take to get to an inclusive green economy. And if I can come to the developing countries where I come from and also probably where I think this discussion is more relevant, I think the first one is to have the right uh, coherent policy frameworks in place. At the moment, what I see that we have policies in developing countries, including my own countries, which are contradicting each other. So we have a policy which is on the environmental policy, but when I the way I work, I, I compare that and mirror it into the employment policy, and then I mirror it into the economic growth policy. I don't see a coherence. I see that we are putting 5% of our GDP into, let's say, improving the environment, but 95% is business as usual. So the first step will be to get policy coherence. We need to have one vision at the central level of the government. This is where we want to go. And I will say, I think it was coming from the EBRD and 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 um, Economic Commission for Europe's example, that the government vision alone is not enough. We need to have the citizens as part of the vision and the private sector. So, so it's great to have the speaker from Japan that, yes, it's the private sector which is coming. Have a national vision and policy coherence. That is the first thing. Once your direction is clear, then we can go into the second steps, which is that who plays what role. And that is usually also not very clear in many cases in many countries. Yeah, So we, we, we are moving in different directions there. And that's where I think the role of the finance, in my view, once the policy is clear, the finance is important. That how do you finance? For giving that signal to the finance, the public finance, in my view, is, is the one which should set the direction so that the private finance can follow. And that's where, you know, what, what, uh, what are the activities that the government is subsidizing is very important. And where you are putting the economic incentives is equally important. So... Fiscal policy incentives, the directions to the market, what type of public procurement policies the government has in place, that becomes the second part, that the government leads by action, and I'm sure the private sector finance will follow. And the third level then is on the implementation on the ground, taking the policies to the ground level. And that's where I think this local level, city level, provincial level, even village level department plans have to be connected with that grand vision. So that is sort of from the policy side where I come in. I can go on, but I'm sure there is very little time left, so I will leave the floor for other colleagues. And I look forward to continuing this discussion with, with you, Almer, and with other colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. And uh, I fully agree that, uh, indeed, on these issues, on uh, development of green economy and also on development of green cities, also smart cities, it should be a government, academia, uh, public and private part platform uh, to make it more inclusive and it, to make it more flexible in order to make to, to be able to make some amendments. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, purpose is to make it uh, life of the citizens more convenient uh, and uh, more economically and environmentally uh, increase quality of the life. 
Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward uh, this also follow up uh, of this uh, cooperation. And now also one question uh, addressed to EBRD and UNEC. Uh, the question is that uh, how to uh, because sometimes uh, some international organizations uh, offer the same uh, similar projects to uh, countries, and uh, some of the developing countries also. Uh, despite that announce uh, that they would like to have demand-driven uh, projects, but sometimes it, in reality, at the end of the day, it is supply-driven, uh, not uh, demand-driven. Uh, and sometimes uh, different international organizations compete uh, with a similar uh, target project. How you, uh, EBRD and UNEC, make sure that there is no duplication between uh, this uh, project, similar project. For example, on the one side, we have this Green City project, which is important project. On the other side, we have uh, UNEC's Smart Sustainable Development, Smart Cities, uh, Smart and Sustainable Cities project, which is also a very important project. Uh, to some extent, they are uh, more or less similar. Uh, how they, these organizations make sure that there are no duplication Application, but contrary, there are, they complement to each other. And this is a question. And secondly, uh, what are the lessons learned uh, from this point of view, uh, from your experiences uh, on implementation of similar projects in other cities? Uh, we can start from EBRD and uh, then UNEC. Please. Thank you. Thank you for the very interesting uh, question. And I would uh, like to join Mr. Assad and congratulate everyone with great presentations. It has been really interesting and it would be good to keep in touch in the future as well. Uh, speaking about the coordination, there are uh, different uh, ways how we're trying to avoid any possible overlap. And that happens on different levels. On one side, one, when we were developing the Green City methodology, we have been uh, cooperating quite closely with different organizations, uh, policymakers and international financial organizations. And we do continue the cooperation and coordination of our efforts, both at the level of our headquarters as well as locally in the markets through our resident offices. Uh, and coordination of efforts happens also in a different way, in addition to directly speaking with organizations who have similar products. Uh, as part of the Green City Action Plan development, we have a mandatory step, which stands in the beginning of the whole process, which we call a policy review. So basically, before our consultants start to work with the city for a period of 12 months while developing a Green City Action Plan. Before that happens, we make sure that we have sort of an inventory of all available policy and strategic papers which the city has to make sure that we incorporate the existing information, do not duplicate, but ensure coherence and coordination of different efforts. This is one of the very successful tools, which proved to be very useful. Um, I could uh, bring example from many GCAPs, but possibly I could bring example from my hometown when we started working in Tbilisi. Tbilisi had so many strategic papers and policy reports that we were surprised ourselves. But we managed to coordinate, not only in the beginning, but in the end, for instance, there was a resilience work undertaken by World Bank, and we made sure to incorporate the resilience networks work into the, our Green City Action Plan. And the city had a CEP also done, and we incorporated it as well. So very briefly, the lesson learned and the best practice example is coordination on one hand through international organizations itself, and then while developing Green City Action Plan in the city, we try to ensure the coherence of all the policies which the city has. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Ms. Gilnara Rol. Yes, thank you so much. I think it was a very good uh, question, so really happy to explain. In fact, I think this, um, any activities that at least, uh, I think now most of international organizations are working on, especially UNEC, are demand-driven. They are never 
can be supply driven because especially UNEC is an intergovernmental organization. I mean, we have a very small secretariat in Geneva, so we have a few people working here. Um, so any activity is generated on a request of a member state, or if it's even on a request of a city, it always has to be confirmed by the member state. So I think this is a fundamental for organization of um, our work. In addition, in order to kind of uh, uh, Look at the trends. At trends, where the actually the needs, uh, where the needs uh, in cities and countries for the uh, possible technical cooperation or policy advice. Uh, as I mentioned, we are organizing forum of mayors. Uh, we are organizing the annual sessions of the committee on urban development, where it's not us. Uh, bureaucrats are speaking, but it is member states are speaking, members, uh, representatives of cities speaking, or representatives of city networks are speaking, representing requests and needs uh, of concrete cities. So we are documenting these uh, expressions of needs. This is why those international forums are very important. Uh, this is not chat rooms. This is the places where representatives of the authorities, uh, we speak about committee for the intergovernmental meeting, or we speak about forum of mayors for the place where the mayors are speaking. And it was last time it was 40 mayors speaking from 36 countries. And this is where they request their needs uh, in, in possible assistance or policy advice. And also usually after such an event, we have bilateral discussions with cities where they say, this is where the city re requires support. So absolutely, our work is always demand driven uh, and it's always checked also with the member states in case if the request coming from the city. Uh, secondly, uh, this work between the organizations is well coordinated as well. And I agree with uh, Tia that it's actually taking place uh, because International organizations are very complex entities. We are working, uh, there is a secretariat, there is a, maybe this committee bringing together senior officials or working on urban issues. There is a forum of mayors or bringing the representatives of mayors. There is a, can be a team of specialists, team of experts working on a very specific technical issue. So there are many different forums maybe on expert level, on specific thematic forums, which are working on regular basis with us. And we have in monthly meetings, bi-weekly meetings, weekly meetings, uh, where uh, these expert groups actually are discussing by themselves about what are the key issues in the region. Also between international organizations, this kind of coordination mechanism exists at different levels. Of course, first of all, at the level of principles of our organizations, you you can imagine that principles of our organizations are regularly meeting within the existing UN institution. You know, the UN has its own architecture uh, where the principles of all the UN agencies working or uh, UN and international financial institutions, they are meeting on a regular basis to coordinate their work. At our more kind of technical level, we have, for instance, I bring you very concrete examples. Uh, there is this United for Smart Sustainable Cities initiative, which brings 16 UN agencies, and we're meeting on a regular basis in different thematic groups. There is SDG 11 days that we're organizing on the, uh, you know, World uh, Urban Day uh, each October. Uh, so this is where all the Geneva-based, we're organizing, of course, it's with, together with UN Habitat, and we. this is where all the partners and city networks meet together, and we coordinate more on operational level um, our work. Um, yeah, so I think it's um, perhaps uh, it's not so visible because it's taking place at very different level, but we should not oversimplify this work uh, because all these organizations working at different level governance, you know, have a very complex uh, coordination mechanisms. And I think we have to be seen in this uh, complexity, but I would like to assure that we are putting lots of efforts into making sure that any activities we're doing is demand driven. It's very important for us because we are very small. Our secretariats are very small, but any activities will be long term, uh, sustainable long term, 
only if it is demand driven. This is, uh, I think this is fundamental and definitely we are follow this uh, belief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your responses. And it is indeed uh, very important that uh, you try to do your best to ensure this, first of all, uh, there is no duplication. It is a contrary complement to each other. Uh, and on the other side, it is uh, demand driven. Uh, I, I, before, I have also several other questions, but before uh, these questions, I would like just to inform that Mr. Asad Nagbi, he should to leave us for other commitments. But that's why I would like to address him uh, questions, second questions addressed to him by the university, and then he can uh, leave. Uh, question is that uh, how university can ensure uh, cooperation uh, between uh, between your center and this university on uh, research uh, discussions and also on uh, discussions of this uh, on green economy for development of green economy in Azerbaijan because universe, our universities also are very keen to develop uh, uh, human capital in green economy field and also develop uh, research uh, capacity. That's why the question is that how uh, concretely they can uh, address this issue. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think that there are many things that we can do. So there is a list of things that we currently offer to work with universities and centers of excellence around the world on green economy. And number two, we can have even a very focused discussion with, with, the, with the researchers at the university to develop a plan. So I can start with what we already offer, and then maybe we can go as a follow-up to what we could do possibly more directly. So number one, we are offering university courses which are already developed in different areas of green economy that different universities are offering around the world. So number one, that we have a whole curriculum on green economy, which is adaptable to different situations, but we have very specific courses, let's say on, on green finance, we have specific courses on green economy, green economy and trade, et cetera, which have been introduced in different universities. And we are very happy to share them with you and help you to adapt it to the local needs and, and the local conditions. So that is one set of things which is already done. Number two, there is a huge work that we started when we started supporting green economic recovery from COVID-19. So we, are, we have a global campaign called Learning for Green Recovery. So that is the second set of six online courses that we are offering uh, for free, again, for adaptation to the country conditions, and we'll be happy to send you the link and the share, share, share it with them. Then I think the learning between universities and academic institutions is also very important. So when we support like in page about 20 partner countries, we have created a green learning network which brings the universities, the curricula, the centers of excellence and research centers together to share their experiences and findings on macroeconomic research, on economic, economic uh, modeling, system dynamic type modeling, et cetera. So that is the third stream that, you know, we will be happy to work with your universities to bring them into the green learning network. And then the fourth one that we offer on capacity building is that it's not only universities which are important, but the academic, uh, but the administrative staff colleges or civil services academies, they need to have a curriculum on green economy so that today's policymakers, but the future policymakers also know what are the economic and development opportunities coming from greening of economy. So we offer that service. And the last one is a small curricula that we offer to the bankers training institutes, because it's not only that we need to mobilize the existing finance, but if the future bankers are aware that how to aware of how to use any type of finance for social sustainability, social social equality, and environmental sustainability, that's what will probably um, change, bring bring the big change. So we work with them. So this is the sort of like the summary of the package that we offer. But then we can also provide tailor made support for universities and work with you. I think the discussion is important that we have this discussion with with the economic university and the students, especially at the PhD level, that how do they conduct research which can support policymaking and directly feed into that. And based on that, then different products can be developed. So thank you so much. My sincere apologies that I have to leave this exciting panel, but it's been a player and I very much enjoy it and learned a lot. And I look forward to continuing the collaboration with all of you. Thank you so thank much. You.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your valuable contribution. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, my uh, another question uh, addressed to Mr. Sakamoto. Uh, there are uh, students uh, among the universities and particular economic universities who are uh, internally displaced persons from Karabakh region. And they are, the question uh, that come from them, uh, when, uh, when it is what is the fr time framework for implementation of your project in Karabakh region? Uh, when uh, this master plan will be uh, ready and when it will be green energy zone will be established? え、このとさん大丈夫ですか質問は。え、そうですね、今質問終わりですか。あの、今の我々の検討してるものがいつ完了するかという質問でよろしかったですか。マスタープランはいつ実施し始めますか。というのは今のあのスタディはいつ終わ
to your conferences, to your uh, forums, uh, and also establishment of cooperation between your relevant competence centers, you know, your relevant uh, institutions, and, and these universities for development of human capital. Uh, indeed, uh, I think that uh, green and development is important, and uh, Azerbaijan, as I mentioned, we have accepted at the national level in the 2030 national priorities, and one of the top priorities is development of the green economy in the whole Azerbaijan. And uh, on the other side, also, uh, actually, our uh, relevant ministries uh, are elaborating uh, jointly with uh, partners, uh, elaborating national concept on uh, smart city. On the one side, smart city, on the other side, uh, green city. But at the end of the day, uh, all these uh, concepts should serve for, uh, to increase uh, living conditions and uh, convenience of the citizens. Once again, thank you very much, and I wish you an excellent day, all of you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.